So, so glad to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, thank you, Ed, for always sobering us up. That's how I always experience you, Ed. Even though I try to catch up with how fast you speak English, I pray that one day God will give me the ability to speak English so fluently as you do. And Munchi, thank you for your word, brother. It made me feel bad because in the apex, the shepherding is the lowest of mine, you know? And I always, when I hear sermons about being good shepherds, I like wanna hide. But thank you for, um, thank you for that word, brother. I really, I really needed that. And um, so what a great experience to be here. Thank you for welcoming me to Miami. Another New Yorker, there's a whole bunch of us coming to Miami and trying to figure out the Miami life. I bought my Mustang, so, and I got my Florida driver's license. So I am a Floridian now. And uh, so, uh, beautiful city, um, closest to Santo Domingo that I can find in the map, so. Uh, lately in the lineup, I've always been like the last speaker. And I'm wondering why, is it like, yeah, bring it home, buddy, or is it like, let's risk it with this dude? I, I don't know what it is, but, but there it is. Now, to say that 2020 has been a very difficult year is, I think, an understatement. Um, between this raging pandemic that just keeps going on and the rabid map politics that we've all been living and the bitter racial polarization, which has affected deeply many of us, um, I feel exhausted. I feel uh, emotionally exhausted. I feel spiritually drained and physically tired. And when, when we have moments like that, we need a word. We believe in the power of the word of God to infuse life where there's no life. I need a word. And the book of Daniel, which we will be uh, reading in a moment, Daniel chapter 7. The book of Daniel um, has definitely been, been that word for me. Uh, when COVID hit, I was actually studying Daniel at that moment. And I think it's because of divine providence that I was studying that book that kept me, kept me going. Because I believe that in this story and the visions that God gave Daniel... We have a powerful word that can sustain us as leaders, but even more than that, it can envision us to push forward in the, in, the, in the calling that God has given us, even in the midst of the exhaustion and the pain and the frustrations of these trying times. Now, I don't know if it's a good idea to end this, these talks with a text like Daniel chapter 7, but I'm going for it. And I'm just going to read a few verses, jump here and there up to verse 15. Daniel chapter 7, you can open your Bibles. I'm going to read from the NIV. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions passed through his mind as he was lying in bed. He wrote down the substance of his dream. Daniel said, in my vision at night, I looked and there before me, were the four winds of heaven churning up the great sea. Four great beasts, each different from the others, came up out of the sea. The first was like a lion, and it had the wings of an eagle. I watched until its wings were torn off. Verse 5. And there before me was a second beast, which looked like a bear. It was raised up on one of its sides, and it had three ribs and its mouth between its teeth. It was told, get up and eat, fill your flesh your fill of flesh. After that, I looked, and there before me was another beast, one that looked like a leopard. And on its back, it had four wings like those of a bird. This beast had four heads, and it was given authority to rule. After that, in my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was a, four, there was a fourth beast, terrifying and frightening and very powerful. It had large iron teeth. It crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. It was different from all the former beasts, and it had ten horns. Verse 9. As I looked, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. 
His clothing was as white as snow. The hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire and its wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court was seated and the books were open. In verse 13, it says, In my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Amen to that. I, Daniel, was troubled in spirit. And the visions that pass through my mind disturbed me. This is the word of the Lord. Now we're all familiar with the nice part of Daniel, chapters 1 through 6. I think we all preach from it, but nobody goes to chapter 7. We can't avoid those kind of chapters, right? Because Daniel chapter 7 is a weird part of the book, as we have just read. Really weird, but it's fascinating. Now, the reason it's weird is because J Daniel uses a form of writing, a literary genre, that we don't use anymore. We're not used to reading this way. This is like three-dimensional reading. We're, we're used to one-dimensional reading. You know, we read the newspaper, we read stories, we read like Con Ed Bill or FPL Bill here in Miami. You know, we, we, we read like straight forward. Many times, if you're like, into your imagination, you read two-dimensional stuff like poetry and, and novels and stuff like that. But this is like full force three-dimensional engagement with literature that was typical of the people of Israel, the Jewish people, when they were living very difficult times. In their history, when they were living devastating times, the apocalyptic literature gave them language to see reality as it really is and not as it appears to be. And this is what the purpose of apocalyptic is. The word apocalyptic means to unveil. It means to capture your imagination and to see things beyond what is apparent. To take us beyond the apparent to the real in full force and full color. And apocalyptic literature always invites us, and this is what I, what I like, why I like this for this time, it always invites us to three things. One is wake up. To be woke is not something of today. That's apocalyptic literature. Wake up. The second is take sides. There's no neutrality. And the third is press on and push back. You got to fulfill your mission. Do not be in intimidated by the moment. Actually, it's an opportunity to be who we are called to be. And Ed has talked, Ed just talked about that. So we see here that Daniel's vision of these four beasts coming out of a raging sea and then the ancient of days seated on the throne. Daniel needed a word and this is the word that he got. Now we all know what was happening in that time. We're all ministers, you know, Daniel and his people that were captured and conquered and invaded their temple destroyed. And they were deported to the Babylonian Empire. And Daniel and his three buddies are now government officials. Things are not going too well. Things are actually getting worse for them. The prior king, I'm not going to say his name. I don't know how to say it. Nabucodonosor, I'll say it in Spanish. But I don't know in English, I'll say it in Spanish. Um, Nabucodonosor, I mean, the guy was like, like, a, like brutal, despot. But, but he listened. He listened to Daniel. Which, which tells us, you know, this is not the message about the influence that we can have even in brutal regimes, right? Daniel lived his calling bravely, faithfully, and he influenced one of the most desperate dictators that human history has ever seen. And things went for the good. But there's always this dude, the, the, the king that now is in place, he's so vicious so freaking immoral and blasphemous and arrogant. He's an idiot. And there's nothing, I mean, someone like that holding so much power, you lose sleep over that. You have nightmares. And that's what Daniel had, a nightmare here. 
And God gives him a vision. God gives Daniel a vision of four beasts. A lion with eagle's wings, and then a hungry bear with three ribs in his mouth, and a voice telling him to keep eating more. And then a creepy leopard with four wings and four heads. And then this terrifying beast is the last one with iron teeth, ten horns. And then, I didn't read this part, but this little horn with a big bragging blasphemous mouth. I don't know what the heck Daniel ate before he went to bed. Probably Mofongo or something like that. Because that's, I mean, this guy is like, this is some dream. But he sees another dreadful but delightful sight at this time. It's a heavenly throne, surrounded by thrones, and a majestic, powerful, glorious figure taking his seat on the throne, the Ancient of Days. Shiny clothes, shiny hair, fiery flames, and millions upon millions surrounding the throne, standing before his presence, ready to serve. And we find that that is a court. It's judgment time. But the thing doesn't stay there. It gets, the thing gets like weirder, but interesting. Someone interrupted that moment of that heavenly vision. Someone interrupted that moment, and we'll see why in a little bit. And guess who? Yeah, the little horn with the big mouth. And spouting out arrogant and deceitful words, challenging whoever dares. But the text says that he was shut up pretty quick, killed and his, the, the, killed and his body thrown into the fire. So Daniel was able to go back to the heavenly vision. It's a court. And what does he see next? Now he sees someone coming with the clouds. It says here, one like the son of man. Finally, <laughs> finally a human face. It's not a beast. It's a human one who was presented before the majestic ancient of days. And check this out. He receives a dominion and a glory and a kingdom so awesome that people from all ethnicities all nations, all languages serve and worship him. And this kingdom, contrary to the beastly ones that have an expiration date, lasts forever and ever and ever. And after asking an angel that was standing there what this all means, especially he was intrigued, Daniel, by the boastful little big mouth horn, he wakes up, and this is what the text says, and this is what caught my attention. That he, Daniel sees where this is going, which is extremely hopeful, yet he is deeply engaged. He's troubled. He's anxious. It says, the text, that he was deeply disturbed, anxious, and alarmed, even when he knew how the story ends. And I wonder why. So what do we learn? Again, three things that apocalyptic literature invites us, especially as Christians leaders. My talk is about being justice-minded leaders. You probably will wonder, aren't you going to talk about that? Yes, exactly. Because justice-minded leaders, the first thing that we are, if we're justice-minded leaders, to be that is we're woke. Wake up. That's the first call of the book of Revelation. That's the second thing is that we are so disturbed by being woken up, that's what it caused, deep disturbance, that we take sides. There's no neutrality. Only people who are not woke can afford to be neutral. And the third thing is it leads us to push on, to press on and to push back. In other words, to live on mission. Let's look at those three things. Oh my. First, just as mind the leaders are woke, wake up, see the world for what it really is. So there are different interpretations in terms of the details of what these beasts represent. But we know this for sure, that each one of these beasts, they, it's, it's, it's like world history here, represents world empires that succeed one another, of which the last one is the most beastly of all. And how do we know this? Because that's what the angel told Daniel, this is what the vision means. Daniel asked, disturbed, in verse 16. And in verse 17, the angel explained to me what everything meant, said Daniel. 
He said, four large animals stand for four kings or kingdoms. The kings will appear on, on earth. And the point is clear. These governing powers that always promise peace, prosperity, and security for all, open your eyes. They're really fierce and devouring beasts. Some more hungry than others, but they're beasts. Don't be fooled. They're not playing games. They're power hungry and they will eat you up. They're hungry and they're beasts. What do you think? You don't mess around with that stuff. They're hungry for prestige. They're hungry for control. They're hungry for power. And of course, they use their power to help a few people here and there, as long as that helping continues to feed their hungry for power and control. That's how, they, that's how the kings of this world help and serve. Jesus calls them benefactors. Wake up, church. Call it socialismo, comunismo, fascismo, capitalismo, whatever you want to call it. They're all devouring beasts. All human systems that promise heaven on earth are beastly in their very nature. Now, how do I know that I'm woke? The, the way I know that I'm woke is because I become deeply disturbed by the knowledge of that truth. Like Daniel, he was deeply troubled even when he was given a vision of hope. My spirit was troubled. The visions that passed through my mind upset me. My thoughts deeply troubled me. That's how it ends. The text ends in the last verse. My face turned pale. As Christian leaders, we should always, even when we engage as we should in the, in, in, in the systems of this world, we're called not to retreat but to engage, but we should do always, always we should be deeply disturbed by the devouring nature of the beastly powers that rule this world. And they take systems and forms. It's not just individuals. This is Babel stuff. The theme of Babel runs from Genesis to the book of Revelation. Evil at its worst, systemic in nature. In the Bible, people of faith, men and women of faith, were always troubled when they saw reality for what it was. Daniel was troubled. Jeremiah was troubled. He couldn't stop crying. Habakkuk, he was troubled, fighting with God. I love David because he, he was a powerful man. He was a man in power. And one of my favorite Psalms is Psalm 10, where David was so troubled by powerful, wicked rulers that he, he describes them as like beasts he, he, in, in poetry here. He says, they hunt down the weak, they murder the innocent, they watch in secret for their victims. Like a lion in cover, he lies in wait to catch the helpless. His victims are crushed, they collapse, they fall under his strength. Daniel is so troubled, guys, guys and gals. Daniel is so troubled that he fights with God. That's how the psalm starts. And that's been like my, my story for with my relationship with God for, for years. Why, Lord? Why do you stand far off? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? It seems like you're aloof. And I'm expecting you to do something because you're the God of justice. Who, who, you're, the, you're the just God who loves justice. Jesus was troubled. His whole mission was to undo the devouring and enslaving power of these beastly forces. He was always a threat to them, by the way. The religious powers, the social powers, the economic powers, the political, he was always a threat. No wonder he went to the cross. And the question is, am I troubled? Am I troubled? And if I'm not, why not? Maybe I have settled for American Christianity. Maybe I have settled for a privatized, individualistic, escapist spirituality that always invites me to political and social neutrality. Hispanics, we have a saying, every time something goes really bad. Eso está en la Biblia. That's in the Bible. And it's our way to say, it's in the Bible, I have nothing. It's, it's, a way, it's, a way, it's an excuse to be passive and just wait for this thing to go down the tubes. 
A faith that leads to indifference is not the biblical faith. By the way, these beastly empires love this kind of domesticated spirituality because you get out of their way and they can keep feeding and praying on the weak and the vulnerable. They love that Christianity. Or maybe it's because I'm actually benefiting from the crumbs that the beasts are eating. And I don't want to upset that stuff because that food is pretty good. Brothers and sisters, we're called to be woke people. The Bible, every, every encounter with God is wake up. Wake up. And by the way, the only way, and when I say politically engaged, I'm not talking about taking, I'm not talking partisan politics here, okay? That's another, that's, that's not what I'm talking about. But the way your spirituality can only lead you to be socially and, and politically neutral and divorce your spirituality from that is, first of all, you have a distorted view of God. Again, as I said, he, the Bible says in Psalm 11, David wrote this. He is just and he loves justice. You know how much he loves justice? One of my favorite texts in the Bible that really, my second repentance, I call it, is Isaiah chapter 1. In Isaiah chapter 1, verse 11 and forward, in Amos chapter 5, there's this, it's a very sobering passage because it says, basically, God hates your worship. God hates our prayers. He can't stand them. God hates our emotive prayers, our, our, our assemblies, if your, if your justice is jacked up. He hates our liturgies when our justice are out of whack. Never in the Bible does the Bible say, does God say, I hate your expressions of justice because your worship is out of whack. Never says that. I don't like the way you serve, like you're serving the poor, but you got a two-string guitar worshiping me. Like your prayers are like disorganized. Your services are disorganized. He never says that. The prophets never say that. They always say your worship, as beautiful as it is and as emotive as it is, you raise your hands. You say many prayers. I can't stand them. Shut the door. Maybe that's why the shores, doors are being shut. Because let justice roll down, Amos chapter 5 says. Are you following me? I'm glad I'm the last speaker. Because this is not easy thing to hear when our spirituality is jacked up. Now, the other thing is why we are not engaged is because you're, di you're distant from the margins. See, the places where the beastly nature of these powers is most seen is in the hood, in communities of need, among the poor and the marginalized. And we can theorize about the poor from a distance, but when you live there, when you engage, when you do life with people, when you do life with the immigrants, when you do life with the black, our black brothers and sisters that have been suffering historically in this, this nation was built on their backs and you see somebody kneeling on it. When you, when you enter into that narrative, you become woke. And you see the beastly, devouring nature of the powers of this world. And if you're not disturbed by that, you need a vision of God. I hope we are. I truly hope we are. Now, Muchi just reminded us, and thank you for that, Muchi, that we should be deeply disturbed by the beastly nature of our own selves. Ha ha. So this begins to set us up on how we engage. We should be troubled by the beastly nature of our own leadership. And Muchi described it so well. We eat our sheep. <laughs> we feed on our sheep. And, and, you know, that takes so many forms this consuming hunger that we have as leaders for legitimacy that plays out in our relationships and in our ministries we use people we even abuse people in our hunger for recognition and legitimacy and and control i mean i confess i have walked over a lot of dead bodies and i've had to repent over and over 
this is the thing. This is, we get this from Adam, y'all. We, we get this from Adam. Even when the oppressed conquer and become the oppressed, you know, the, what, what happens? They can become the new oppressors. It's just built into the fabric of who we are. But these beasts take this to another level because it's about be systems and powers in place that feed on all that. So the second thing is, wake up. The second thing is justice-minded leaders take sides. Daniel has a vision that is profoundly hopeful in this passage. Where is God in all this? Well, he's sovereignly present and he's ruling. He's the ancient of days. He's the eternal God. He's the wise, powerful judge who's ready to put things in order. So he is the eternal God. That's what ancient, ancient of days means. He's eternal versus the temporal rules. All beastly kingdoms will pass away. They all have this present one, which is fading away, also will, 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 will die out. But we are to be anchored in the eternal one. That's where our anchor should be. He is the wise God. In the midst of this chaos, there's one in control. From the beginning, God is turning chaos into order and beauty and life. And these beastly structures, they return chaos. The chaotic, the chaotic powers that are held back. You know why they're held back? Because God is still at work. He's ruling. So we have to walk in wisdom in the midst of this. And he is at work. Powers are at check. They're not as bad as they could be, by the way, because of common grace. And because God's people are in it. We are the salt. We are the light. And he is the judge. It says here, the court sat in judgment and the books were open. Many in today's culture don't like this part of the narrative. Like God is a God of, that judges people. You know, like... People in today's culture, when you throw that word in preaching, you better stop and make a comment because you're going to turn off like half of the room or maybe two-thirds of the room. But guess who got upset when the books were open and the judge took his seat? In the narrative, it is the little horn with a big, arrogant mouth. Power doesn't like that stuff. He goes wild. It says, verse 11, I looked then because the sound of great words, arrogant and defying that the horn was speaking. He interrupted the scene. So wait a minute. Okay, so here, here's the good news. Here comes the good news, my friends. And this is why it's a vision of hope. Even though when the, when the books are open, we should be probably shaking and trembling and fearful. Because after all, we're all oppressors. But here it is. When the vision of the judgment comes, then appears in the clouds one like the Son of Man, to whom is given dominion and glory and everlasting kingdom that shall not pass away and will never be destroyed. Finally, there is a kingdom with a human face, a humanizing kingdom, one that gives life, one that is not devouring, what is the one that is not dehumanizing, one that whatever it touches, things flourish. One of which people of all ethnicities and cultures and language come together and worship and serve him and serve one another. <laughs> I hope you know who he's talking about, right? I mean, the title most used by Jesus to describe himself was son of man. And it got him into trouble because they knew what he was talking about. He mentioned Daniel 7, the vision of Daniel 7. He said, blaspheme, crucify him. But this is the beautiful thing that Daniel did not see, but we now see. That gives us so much hope, even in a world that is so devouring like the one that we live in. In Mark chapter 10, verse 5, Jesus refers himself as this son of man. But nobody saw how this son of man was going to take the throne. Nobody saw how it was going to be. And he says, for the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He united son of man with suffering servant. Nobody saw that coming. And that's our hope, friends. That is our hope. That he became king by taking our pain, bearing our suffering, being punished, judged, stricken, and afflicted by God, the ancient of days. He was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities, the punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds, we are healed. All of this 
Daniel saw in his vision. And he saw people from all ethnicities and all nations and all languages serving the Son of Man who was given dominion. And those are the ransomed ones. Only the ransomed and the rescue are there. Joyful because they know they deserve something else. And they're there joyful. Serving voluntarily. What, what, see, when you see him through the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit has to open our eyes to see him. We voluntarily, willingly, humbly, gratefully surrender to the king. We surrender to the king. We see the price that he paid for, for becoming the king. And no wonder his death was on the cross. I mean, he, I mean, Jesus used title that beastly powers appropriated for themselves, wrongly appropriated for themselves. He called himself Kurios. That was the emperor, son of God. That was the emperor. What do you think is going to happen when you say Messiah? The powers of this world feel threatened. The invitation for us, but then came Easter. Praise God. Came Easter, and the king conquered through his death, through humility. He put them all on their knees. He exposed the beastly nature of all the powers and authorities of this world in the cross. I always call the Via Dolorosa the march of protest of Jesus against the powers of this world that led them to be exposed to the max in their beastly nature. That's another talk. But the invitation is, as leaders, we need to recover a gospel that has as the center the confession, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. The problem with American Christianity, I think, is Jesus is Savior, but the beasts continue to be lords. When we confess Jesus, we are renouncing the beast. There is no middle ground. We have to take sides. That's how our conversion is described in Colossians. is being transferred from the dominion of darkness to the kingdom of his beloved son and who we have redemption and forgiveness of sins. See, when we preach and teach Jesus, people need to hear clear what are the implications of this Jesus that he is Lord. They need to see the problem with, with, with our, the problem I think is the problem of discipleship. I agree with Alan Hirsch here. It's a problem of discipleship. The lack of this in our leadership of, of, talking, of, of, of talking about the implications of what it means to be Jesus Lord is evidence of how our people have been, have been easy, our people have been so easily co-opted by the beastly agendas of partisan politics. They only see two options because they never, they don't know what it means to bow before Jesus the King. We haven't taught them. Why are people debating between this or that? And I say, well, wherever God calls you, be a prophet in your own camp, buddy. Be salt and light in your own camp. Because it's easy to be against the other one. But guess what? The gospel is neither. Jesus confronts the beastly nature of both. And if you're a Democrat, fight against the beastly nature of that beast. And if you're a Republican, fight against the beastly nature of that beast. You belong to Jesus, the only kingdom with a human face. And finally, justice-minded leaders are not only woke and not only have to take sides, and I'll be brief here because my time is up, we have to push on. We have to press on and push. Okay, notice the, I, I don't, I haven't, I didn't read this part, but there's an interchange here. There's an interchange. My time is up, right? Okay. There's a, yeah, usually when the guy comes from the back and I'm just like, <laughs> shut up, give, okay. But I, I don't want to, I don't want to miss this because this is to me, okay, th notice the interchange. In verse 14, it says the son of man was given a kingdom. But then in verse 18, it says the saints of the most high received the kingdom. Ooh, oh man. Oh, okay, I got, I got five minutes for this one. Check this out. This humanizing, life-giving nature of this kingdom where life and reconciliation and restoration and justice and love prevail is to be carried out by who? 
by the church. That's us. That's us. We have received a kingdom. Now, how do we carry out this rule? How do we do it? And I'm going to quote two Latino theologians because they say it best. Puerto Rican theologian Jules Martinez Olivieri, he speaks about the church as the theater of, revel, of liberation. And, and this is what he says. The church is as a company of actors performing the drama of the kingdom coming. Oh, man, we are like to be the drama that people see performing the drama of the, of, the, of the kingdom that will come. Let me show you a piece of it right here, right now. A communal witness to the reality that another world is possible. Characterized by justified people acting justly, being visible actors of God's justice-making activity. I mean, if... if <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm not going to go there. Um, time is up. But I love the way that uh, one of my heroes of the faith, Christian martyr Bishop Oscar Romero, he describes this justice-making activity of the church as an act of violence. <laughs> and check this out. It says, the empires of this world, they exercise their beastly rule through violence. We, as witnesses of a different kingdom, Practice a different kind of violence, the violence of love. Which left Christ nailed to the cross, the violence that we must each do to ourselves to overcome our selfishness and such cruel inequalities among us. The violence we preach is not the violence of the sword, the violence of hatred. It is the violence of love, the violence of brotherhood, a sisterhood, the violence that wills to beat weapons into sickles for work. And this is the thing, when we live, live, you know why it's a violence? Because that's what, when we live Christianity as we should, the beastly powers will see us as a threat. They will see us as something violence against their violence. When we love people, when we live this reconciliation, when we practice justice and love mercy and walk humbly before our God, that is a threat. To the hungry powers of this world. And that is how we are to live. Bishop Oscar Romero says this, and I want to end with this. A church that doesn't provoke any crisis. A gospel that doesn't unsettle. A word that doesn't get under anyone's skin. A word of God that doesn't touch the real sin of society in which it is being proclaimed. What gospel is that? Very nice, pious considerations that don't bother anyone. That's the way many would like preaching to be. Those preachers who avoid every thorny matter so as not to be harassed, so as not to have conflicts and difficulties, do not light up the world they live in. Just-minded leaders are woke. Take sides and press on. God bless you.